Well, good morning. In my family, I am known as a magnet for calamity. So it was a month ago, I was out snow skiing with our two sons and two friends, and it was the last run of the day, um, we were coming down the mountain, and uh, the clouds were low, the visibility wasn't great, and as I get older, that's sometimes a problem for me. So I didn't hit a tree or anything like that. But what happened is all of a sudden the ground gave way and there was a drop and I didn't see it. I I don't remember it. And I went flying and landed really hard on my right shoulder. And the next day, I ended up having surgery at the hospital at the the base of um, uh, where we were skiing. We actually have a video. Now, that's not me. (laughs) I'm a lot better than that. I do helicopter. No. (laughs) That guy's a lot younger than I am. So, but you get the idea. I I love to ski. Actually, one of our our sons was behind me. Both of the sons were right there with me, and I lost a ski as I, I went flying. He hit my ski. He went flying. And so there was a, what we call a yard sale in skiing. There were bodies all over the place. But what is true is that my prognosis is great. I'm in this sling 24-7. I'll be out of it in just a a couple of weeks. And I I mentioned this in the last service. And, John, I want to say this to you and the elders that are present um, in in this service with us. Maybe you guys ought to reconsider how long you want me to stick around. (laughs) No telling what's ahead. So we are in this uh, delightful series, this actually amazing series In Jesus' last words, Jesus' final teaching with the disciples. And last words we all know were such important words. They're weighty words. And certainly our lords are especially that. Jesus knows he's about to be crucified. He knows that he's going to leave the disciples. He knows uh, that the disciples will see God do incredible things in the months and the years to come as they establish the church the first century church, but Jesus also knows their days are going to be long, the road's going to be difficult, they're going to face peril and disappointment, rejection and persecution at almost every corner as they give themselves in a world that's been hostile to Jesus, unequivocally to Jesus. So that section of God's, or that section is recorded for us in the Gospel of John, and Uh, near the end of John 13, certainly the beginning of John 14, all the way through John 17. It's in John 14, 15, and 16 that Jesus teaches. Today we are in John chapter 17. Jesus is done teaching, and now he's praying for the disciples in light of what he just taught them. And we're going to pick it up in verse 6 and look all the way, or go all the way through verse 19, And I want to do two different things. Uh, It's almost like there's two messages within this message. We're going to look at the first part of uh, this section, verses 6, 7, and 8 primarily. And look at what Jesus tells us. Now hear me in this, what it means to be a believer. What it means to be a follower of Christ. What it means to be a Christian. We're going to see him say some incredible things. And then we're going to jump to the end of the passage. And we're going to look at what Jesus wants for us as Christians. So would you stand with me as we read beginning in John chapter 17 and verse 6. I have revealed you, Jesus is speaking to God the Father, I have revealed you to those you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now, Jesus isn't talking about the disciples of Bain, the entirety of the Old Testament. They didn't do that. Their lives were marked by failure during the years Jesus was with them, unbelief. But what has happened is, now that Jesus is about to be crucified, they have come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. 
So it's better to read, um, they have obeyed your word, as really they have obeyed the gospel. They have come to believe in Jesus as the promised king of kings. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. Fascinating statement. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, this is the only time in the Gospels that Jesus addresses uh, God as ho Holy Father. He addresses God as Father regularly, several times here. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and gave, kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Now Jesus is talking about Judas and he's making it clear that Judas is in hell. I am coming to you now, but I say these things, what he's been saying in this upper, what's called the upper room discourse, while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world, for I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. You may be seated. This is God's word. Now to be a, a believer in Christ is to turn from life apart from Christ and to trust Christ or receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Uh, now this is before the crucifixion. And Jesus is anticipating this fundamental understanding that the apostles will preach of what it means to be a Christian. But here Jesus nuances that. He sort of lays a foundation for that. And gives us four marks, if you will, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Actually, you can also think of these in terms of four grounds for why he is praying so fervently for us as followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells us, first of all, that to be a Christian means you are God's. You are not the world's. You are God's. And so he says, they were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. Now this is life-giving. This is amazing, friends. Because to be a Christian means you, you tell yourself, I may face all sorts of difficulties, disappointments, dangers, daggers, uh, uh, despair. But I am not my own. I am not on my own. I, I am God's. I have been created by the sovereign God of the universe, in whose hands the stars are like specks of dust. Uh, by a God who is so fundamentally loving, so fundamentally compassionate and merciful uh, that he sent his son to rescue me, uh, to redeem me so that one day he might fully restore me in his presence forever in heaven. So as your creator, your God is your king. In Jesus Christ, your God is your father. And if you were to take all the greatest kings throughout human history and combine them, they would pale in comparison to how great your heavenly king is. If you were to take all the greatest fathers in human history, roll them 
into one. No comparison. The gap is infinite. Because your God is the greatest father in the universe. And to be a Christian means you know that. Do you know this? Can you say, I am God's? And if this is wonderful to you, if you have pressed this reality into your life, then it gives you a significance, it gives you an identity, it gives you a confidence on your worst days. Last week, Rhonda and I were in Iowa. Her father had uh, died And we were there for the funeral, and we were with Rhonda's family. And just as we were leaving, I got a call from a friend, a guy here at Wheaton Bible Church, a guy whose life has been extraordinarily challenging on so many different fronts. And he was in the hospital. He was here at CDH, and his voice was really weak. You see, his kidney is failing. He needs a kidney transplant. And he was having kidney problems. And as I talked to him, I was struck by the contrast between the weakness of his voice and the strength of his faith. His absolute confidence in light of all the things he's been through over the years in God. His confidence that uh, he is not on his own. He is not even his own. He is God's. And so as we talked that weekend, as we texted that weekend... It was such an encouragement to me. I love the way Isaiah pictures this. This is a verse I want you to carry with me. What does it mean to be God's? It means that God has engraved your name on the palm of his hands. That's how precious you are to him. So Jesus says, first of all, what it means to be a believer is it means you are fundamentally God's. Second. You were given by God to Jesus. So Jesus says, they were yours, you gave them to me. Now you may have never thought about this uh, before, but it's a beautiful thing. And so I want to take a minute and I want to unpack this. And I want you to understand, according to the Apostle Paul, this happened before the foundation of the world. So look at what Paul says in Ephesians. For he chose us in him before the creation or the foundation of the world. To what? To be holy. To be blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with God's happiness. His delight, his pleasure, and his will. This is a biblical doctrine of election. The biblical doctrine of predestination. And when Jesus says to the Father, you gave them to me, Jesus is saying the same thing. Uh, Now let me illustrate this with parenting. What do we want to do as as parents as we raise our kids? What is a, a good parent fundamentally about? A good parent is fundamentally about making sure our children are secure in our love that they know we love them that our fundamental commitment isn't not the, that they be famous that may happen uh, but that, that they are our love why uh, so they will see us point to the even greater majestic love that God has for them Jesus is saying the same thing here This is what uh, predestination and election is all about. Uh, Jesus wants us to know how deeply loved we are, how permanent, how eternal, how everlasting that love is. Jesus wants you to be secure. You are God. And God the Father loves you so very much that he gave you to me. His firstborn son. You know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, you Bill, or you Beth, or you Marcos, or you Isabella. 
are mine. I will never, never let you go. Now, I say this because some people look at election and predestination and say, oh, go, it means we're robots. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The whole point of the Bible emphasizing election and predestination over and over from the Old Testament uh, through the New Testament is so that you will have confidence in the love of your heavenly parents. Parent. So let me apply this to the area of temptation. We are all tempted all the time. And you've been tempted and you've fallen. And, and maybe you've been tempted in this area a bunch of times. And you've fallen a, a, a bunch of times. So how do you respond to your sin? What do you do? Well, there's basically three different ways to respond. The first is you can deny it. You can minimize it. That's what the world does. There's no such thing as sin. Or you can be so guilt-ridden and feel so bad about yourself, so ashamed of yourself, and you sort of intuit that God is a taskmaster in heaven that you begin to withdraw from God. You actually start to run from God. Or third, you can so be so secure, I should say, in your salvation that you are God's, that God has given you to Jesus. That instead of running from God, you run to God. I mean when you sin. And you take advantage of the wonder of Hebrews chapter 4. And you uh, uh, come to the throne of grace with confidence. That you might receive mercy and find grace in your time of need. I mean in your sin. So what do you do? Do you deny sin? Do you retreat and run from God because of your sin? Or do you run to God because you are secure? That you have been chosen before the foundation of the world and no one, no one is going to take you out of God's hands. I just happen to love this. This has meant the world to me in the ups and downs of my life. So let me go on here. And let's look at what Jesus said third, third. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? What's a, the third mark? It means you are a person who continually knows and experiences God. Now, how in the world can I say that? Well, this is what Jesus says at the beginning of verse 6. I have revealed you, God, to them. To these uh, disoriented, easily confused uh, sometimes hard of heart uh, disciples and uh, Jesus is speaking uh, about all of us I mean think about it Jesus reveals God uh, Jesus uh, let me say it this way Jesus reveals the power of God to you in his miracles in his parables he reveals the wisdom of God in his ongoing confrontation in the Gospels with the Pharisees, he, he reveals the importance of a, a commitment to the truth of God, to standing and living uh, based on truth. In the incarnation, what does Jesus do? Jesus reveals to you the humility of God. In his perfect life, he reveals the holiness of God. In his death, uh, the forgiveness of God. In his word, he reveals to you the character of God, the heart of God. The, the truth of God in creation, in the lives of people around you, uh, your small group, other believers that God has brought into your life. He reveals different aspects of the wonder and the beauty of all that God has for you in, in Jesus Christ. I have revealed you to them. To be a Christian is to continually know and experience the living God. <laughs> I, I'm usually reading a couple books at a time, and I'm reading a little book right now, and I got clobbered by a little chapter in this little book where the author took me to Matthew chapter 11 and said something I never thought about. Jesus is speaking, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. And the author makes the point that this is the only place Jesus ever talks about his heart. 
And what is Jesus' heart? It's tender. It's kind. It's gentle. It's humble. Humble means uh, lowly. Uh, Jesus is not reactionary. His disposition towards you is not being aloof, exacting, uh, demanding. He's not quickly disappointed in you. Uh, Jesus instead is the most gentle, patient, kind, tender, compassionate person in the universe. And the same is true of God the Father and God the Son. Speaking of the Father, Paul says, look at the end of this verse, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, or you can translate it the Father of all mercies, the God of all comfort. Now, the application of this to our lives is just amazing, amazing. So let me look at those uh, robust theological um, movies called the Terminator series, okay? <laughs> so what happens in the Terminator if you peel back the skin? Well, what you discover is a machine. What happens when you peel back the skin of Jesus? You find love. Jesus Christ is love clothed in a body. Jesus Christ has come to reveal that, that we live in a world of love made by a God of love who has sent his son to redeem us so we might experience an eternity of love. Why in the world are we as his people so unloving, so impatient, so harsh, so anxious, uh, so indifferent, so unwilling uh, to press into the needs around us? God isn't. He's the father of compassion, the God of all comfort. Jesus is gentle and lowly in heart. Now think about this, the very same God that wept at the tomb of Lazarus is the very same God that weeps with you in your lonely despair. The very same God that reaches out and, and, and touches lepers and, and heals them is the very same God that wraps his arms around you when you're confused or you feel underappreciated or ignored or, or, or passed over. The very same God that involved himself in the lives of sinners is the very same God that steps into your heart and begins to pull out the weeds over time and to cleanse you that you might become as compassionate and as comforting as he is. Jesus, friends, hear me in this. Jesus has never promised life would be easy. And you run from people that suggest that. But Jesus is declaring that your father, that he, is a God of infinite love. And his heart, well, his heart towards you just happens to be gentle and humble. And I want you to know that. Finally, how do you know if you're a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian according to Jesus here? Well, it means that Jesus' teaching is, is, is changing your life. Look at verse 8. For I gave them the words you gave me, and, and they didn't walk away from them. They accepted them. And as a matter of fact, they knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. To be a believer in Jesus Christ to, is to accept Jesus' words. To know with certainty that Jesus has come from the Father and to believe him. And if you go back to verse 6, I mean the end of verse 6, it means you keep Jesus' words, you obey Jesus' words. Not perfectly, but progressively. This is the only way you can tell whether or not you're a Christian or somebody is a Christian. Not by their words. But by the slow and steady gospel changes 
in your life. This is why Jesus earlier in the Sermon on the Mount put it this way. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. That's what Jesus is saying. By their fruit, Father, these uh, men are committed to me. Bless them. Carry them. And so maybe you wonder if you are a Christian. And I want you to see what Jesus is saying here in verses 6, 7, and 8. Or or maybe you're here and the Spirit is speaking to you and and you know that you're not a Christian. And I, I want to invite you to come to Jesus now. No one is more gentle. No one is more humble. No one is more tender. And Jesus gave his life that the moment you believe, you might live. Now let me go on. I want to move now from the front end of this passage to the back end of this passage. I want to move from what Jesus tells us, how he nuances what it means to be a Christian, to what Jesus wants for us as Christians. And there's a lot of things in the balance of this section that I read that we aren't going to take the time to look at that Jesus prays about. But I want you to see one thing he prays about. I just happen to think it's the most important thing. And that is your holiness. Your godliness. And let's read these verses. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. I am sending them into the world for for them. Notice those two words, for them, for you. I sanctify myself that they may be kind of sort of sanctified. Occasionally sanctified? No, truly sanctified. Now when Jesus prays here, sanctify them, Jesus is praying, God, make them holy. And all the difficulties that's going to be ahead for them, all the challenges, all the incredible opportunities, make them men that are, make them people that are fundamentally holy. But holiness here and I'm going to prove this in a second, doesn't uh, merely mean rule keeping. It means you as a follower of Jesus Christ are totally committed. You're all in. You're totally focused on uh, loving and knowing and serving uh, the living God. That's because this word sanctify means to separate. It means to set apart. It means to set aside. So we see this with the utensils in the Old Testament tabernacle and and temple uh, to to set them aside for God's uh, purposes. And this is exactly how Jesus uses it. So let's zero in on verse 19. I find these first five words remarkable. For them I sanctify myself. For them, for you, for me. Now, Jesus is already perfect. So, uh, sanctify here can't mean merely becoming better. Jesus can't become better. So, what does it mean? Well, it means that Jesus has separated himself. Uh, Jesus has uh, set himself aside by becoming a man so that he might go to the cross and die in our place for our sins, which he is about to do in a matter of a couple hours. For them, I set myself aside to die. For you, I am going to the cross. I am laying down my life. An amazing statement here. Uh, So let me just say this again. The biblical concept of holiness is not 
merely external behavior. It's an orientation of your heart and your life. It's a, it's a dedication, a fundamental commitment. It's you being all in uh, with Jesus, totally committed, totally focused on him, wherever you are, whatever you are doing. I mean, you're in your school, I, I, where you work, in your sport, in your neighborhood. And nothing can distract you. Nothing can keep you from Jesus. Now, there's all sorts of ways to illustrate this, but think of an Olympic athlete. Think of this, prof- well, this woman who is training to win a gold medal in her sport. What does she do? She separates herself from things that aren't necessarily bad things, uh, or, or evil things or Im- immoral things, but things that will be a distraction, things that will be impediments uh, to her training, her rigorous training, her rigorous discipline and focus. Why? Because she's focused on the gold. She's focused on winning the, this gold medal. Uh, so she is set apart, if you will, in the language of Jesus. She is sanctified for that one purpose, the gold medal. And what Jesus is saying here in these five words is, that is exactly what I have done for you. That's how much I love you. And now he prays at the end of the verse that we as his people would do the same thing. And set ourselves apart for Jesus as we live life in this fallen world. Now, how do we know the kind of progress we're making in becoming holy, godly uh, people, students, uh, uh, adults? I want to, just as I looked at four marks of what it means to be a believer, I want to look at uh, four ways you can tell uh, you're making progress in your godliness, in your holiness. And here's the first. There is more joy and less anger in your life. And this is verse 13. Look at at the end of verse 13. So that they may have the full measure, not a partial measure, not a half measure, not a puny measure, but a full measure of my joy within them. Joy, friends, is not automatic. It's the flag that flies over the heart when the king is in residence. And if you're a person that's prone to anxiety, this is what you want desperately. Now what is anger? Anger is the visceral, and by visceral I mean emotional response to having a goal block. You want this, this doesn't happen, so you're ticked off. Joy, on the other hand, is the emotional response to knowing that nothing can block God's goals, purposes, plans for your life. That he's working all things, all things together for good. That his plans for you are good. And when you understand that no matter how deep the water, no matter how difficult or terrible the the trouble, uh, you will be a person that will have a a, a, a residue of, of joy that permeates your outlook on life. So for example, think of Jesus on the cross. Jesus was the only innocent person that ever lived. Jesus was the only perfect person that ever lived. And yet he's unbelievably, unimaginably tortured. And the experience is a horrific, one of uh, humanity's most brutal forms of death, death by crucifixion. And yet on the cross, Jesus doesn't display a sliver of anger, irritability, even toward the very people that were crucifying him. Instead, he says, Father, forgive them. He doesn't say, slam them. It 
So how do I know if I'm becoming more holy? There is more joy and less anger in my life. You see, when God is your gold, you won't hold grudges. You won't explode. You won't implode. You won't hold other people's sins and failures uh, against them. Uh, somebody has said, if you're a person that travels through life and you hold grudges, uh, then what you're functionally saying is, my God holds grudges against me. And you have taken your eyes off Jesus and the forgiveness that is yours in him. Second, how do I know I'm growing in um, holiness? Well, I'll experience difficulty, but my difficulty will not lead to defeat. This is verses, um, this is verses 14 and 15. And, and at the end, uh, Jesus talks about the enemy. He talks about Satan, that we would be protected. And when Jesus is saying um, they're in the world, but um, not of the world, what, what Jesus is saying is, well, friends, life isn't going to be easy. Uh, my goal for your life isn't that you be chronically comfortable. But that when difficulties come, that you will be so protected by me that Satan can't bushwhack you and turn a difficulty into a disaster. And so Jesus prays for protection. And again, I want to remind you, using the metaphor that training for a gold medal is hard. It's challenging. It requires the best of who you are. And it's the same with the kingdom of God because Satan wants to come along and convince you that real happiness is found in the horizontal, not the vertical. That real happiness is found in the stuff of creation so that you get too busy and you don't ever have time for the creator. That Jesus, well, yeah, Jesus is useful, but man, I'm pressed in life and I got a lot going on. And there's been very few moments in your life when Jesus has really been beautiful. That's what the enemy wants. And then you will be defeated. And Jesus is praying, God, in their difficulty, may it not ever lead to defeat. And third, you tremble at, but you do not, you do not ignore God's word. So this is verse 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your, your, your word is truth. Uh, the Bible is to your soul what fuel is to your car. Uh, the Bible is to your soul what food is to your body. It's what the playbook is, is to your, your sport. Now think about it. The fall of the human race began with a lie, with a distortion, with a twisting of truth. It began when Satan whispered false doctrine into the ears of Adam and Eve. And ever since that time, it, when we deny the truth, when we functionally ignore the truth, when we compromise the truth, when we get too busy for the truth, you know, uh, we're not moving towards holiness. We're, we're taking steps backwards. We've just put it in reverse. And here is what Jesus is praying Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. He's praying that you would be people of the word. That you would have a plan. You would have a place. You would have a process for reading God's word, for memorizing God's word. That you would be involved with the people that speak God's word into your life. The church would matter to you as you sit under the teaching of God's word and you listen to God's word. So you are a person who, like Jeremiah, I mean, Jeremiah chapter 15, uh, when Jeremiah says, when your words came to me, I ate them, and they were my joy and the delight of my heart. And finally, and I'm done, you will live a scent, not a superficial life. Now look at this. In verse 17, Jesus talks about sanctify. He prays about that. In verse 19, the same thing. And in the middle, in verse 18, he talks about you and me living in the world. In other words, Jesus is saying, God has chosen you. I have redeemed you. The Holy Spirit has endowed you with gifts and uh, time and talents and a particular personality and a unique, 
unique set of circumstances so that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you might lift me up and you might seek the good, the love uh, of the people uh, around you. That you will live a selfless, not a selfish life. And to the extent you and I keep our eyes on Jesus and the sacrifice and the the, uh, service he has offered us. As the gospel works its way into our hearts and minds, we can't help but do the same. Let's pray.